Welcome to Insight. Today we're chatting with Kevin Causey, Director of Development for SF Jazz. Kevin began his career in theater as an actor, director, and producer. He has broad experience raising funds for nonprofit organizations, having served Naropa University, the Kemp Children's Foundation, the Center for American Theater, and Outward Bound. And he currently serves as the Director of Development for SF Jazz, the largest presenter of jazz programming in the Western United States. The organization has over 3,000 members and growing, and well over 100,000 attend SF Jazz performances annually. The organization provides rich educational programming, which reaches over 10,000 children, youth, and adults. Kevin has generously agreed to share some of his insights with us today, and I'd like to thank you, Kevin, for joining us today. It's my pleasure to be here. You've had so many different experiences over the years as a, a leader and as a development director in, in a whole range of organizations, from universities to Outward Bound, from art organizations, performing art organizations, uh, ranging from theater to now jazz. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about your experiences in the development field and, and some of the contrasting realities that these different organizations uh, encounter as they try to raise funds? Yeah, it's interesting in that um, while there are some core tenets of fundraising and development work uh, that apply across the board, uh, the missions of varied organizations really dictate to a large extent the approach in which we take uh, to talk with donors, be they institutional donors or individual donors. Some might argue that some cells, if you will, are easier than others. You know, certainly the Kemp Children's Foundation, uh, which is a leader in working with abused and neglected kids, there was no selling involved. It was just simply a matter of articulating the case and that was that. Uh, but even the value of, of, of the Kemp Children's Foundation programs need to be expressed. Absolutely. Uh, and what's interesting there is that it really ran the gamut from talking with some people just about the moral imperative of taking care of those kids. For other people, it was the sheer economic and social benefits of healing those kids. Because the cost-benefit analysis is if, if you reach those kids at a very early age and uh, wrap uh, care around them, if you will, at a young age, the cost of caring for those kids is significantly less than if you wait until they're older, until they're teenagers or, or beyond. So the cost to society, if you will, uh, is a whole lot less the younger you work with these kids. If you wait till they grow up to become adults, then you have incarceration and all kinds of uh, inev inevitable outcomes that are inordinately more expensive. So for some donors, that was the key. For other donors, it was simply that there was a poor child that had been abused, and that was enough. So even within a singular organization, there's a whole range of ways to discuss uh, the impact for individuals and society uh, within that one kind of work. So these donors are making investments and they want to know what their return is in, in, in terms that they, that they themselves value. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and is that just as true for an organization like Outward Bound or, or an organization like um, uh, some of the theaters that you've worked with? Absolutely. Uh, donors, uh, again, be they institutional or, or individual, uh, are clearly making an investment and they think of it as such. The return on that investment can't be sometimes quantified like you can just a straight dollar return on an investment in the, in, in the for-profit world. Uh, but nevertheless, they want to see outcomes that they can point to, that they can feel, that they can touch, that they can smell. Um, and so those things are going to be key. And for an arts organization, it could be, again, the number of children served through an educational program. It could be the broad base or, or sheer numbers of audiences that, that, that are attending and they want to see a growth in that number. Uh, whatever the case might be, there are specific outcomes that they tie directly uh, to the uh, investment that they put into that organization. And what is the value proposition of, of an organization like SF Jazz, other than the, the obvious that, that SF Jazz is presenting? jazz, but if the value proposition were just the ability to attend concerts, people would simply buy tickets. Mm -hmm. And that's earned income as opposed to contributed income. Mm -hmm. um, an organization like SF Jazz uh, in many ways is, is utterly unique in that we take a broader view of what presenting music is. Uh, so that even though our core value is the preservation and creation of new works within jazz uh, and then the dissemination of that work, to as many people as possible. Um, we take a broader view of what the definition of jazz is. Um, 
the very core nature of jazz, what makes it magical, what makes it special, is that it's rooted in improvisation. It's what happens between the notes, between the measures, underneath the bars, those sorts of things. So we define jazz as music that is impacted, defined by that notion. So it could be traditional Balkan wedding and, and funeral music. It could be uh, uh, native Brazilian uh, kinds, of, kinds of musical traditions. It, it could be all kinds of music if there is a core tenet in there somewhere of the ability to improvise. So it's the, it's the creation of art within the performance itself. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And it, and it isn't just the traditionalist notion of what jazz is. It's not, when, when you look at the list of performers, and it's an astounding list of performers that are presented at SF Jazz, you go from people who would be right smack in the middle of, of traditionalist jazz mm -hmm. toward uh, people who are uh, breaking all sorts of, quote, rules in Ab performance. Absolutely. You have dance involved. You have uh, tap. You have... Uh, all sorts of different types of, with of course the, the focus on always coming back to, to, uh, to, to jazz as, as an art form. Mm -hmm. But that idea of creating the art within the performance is, is the thing that's at the That core. is the thing. That's exactly right. So again, the, it, it almost doesn't matter to us in some sense where the music is originating from. It doesn't have to be traditional New Orleans jazz or Chicago jazz, that sort of stuff. It could be Caribbean music. It could be South American music. It, it could be European. Um, but the ability to work inside and outside, and there's a flow and all that sort of thing, that's the kind of music we want to present. Um, Additionally, you're right, you hit it right on the head in that it's not just simply about the present, uh, presentation of music for an audience. It's also instilling the accessibility to that kind of work to kids in schools and to, uh, to adults who have not had that opportunity. Um, we feel very strongly that music itself can be a motivator, can be an inspiration, can be uh, more than simply entertainment. And so we want to make sure that as many people as possible have access to the creation of music in as many ways as possible. So hence your education programming as well as your performances. Exactly. And, and sometimes they cross. Uh, we have educational programs that are part of our concerts. Pre-concert talks and discussions with the, with the musicians after a show, things like that. Tell us a little bit about the artist in residence um, idea, because very often when we work for a presenting organization, they present. Mm -hmm. um, some presenting organizations are getting into producing. Mm -hmm. uh, some presenting organizations have very strong education mm -hmm. uh, pr uh, programming. Um, there also can be a very engaged dialogue between the audience and, mm -hmm. and the performers. It seems that SF Jazz aspires to, to all these things. Absolutely. Well, and the thing that, that I think makes us unique too is we do all of those things and not just do them simply for the sake of doing them. We really focus time, energy, and expertise on those things. Um, the SF Jazz Collective is one example. Uh, we bring eight, nine, depending uh, on the makeup of the band, uh, top-notch musicians to come and spend a year together in residence. And what they'll do is focus on the work of a jazz legend, um, McCoy Tyner or Nett Coleman, whomever the case might be, and create new arrangements of traditional or classic uh, jazz pieces, as well as composing new works inspired by, informed by, in opposition to even the artists whose work they're, they're looking at. So we are also very committed to the idea of creating more work, original works, and continuing the idea that uh, if jazz is going to continue to thrive and survive, there needs to be more of it written and performed uh, and, and spread out to the world, as it were. Now, all these activities are not just supported by ticket sales. Mm -hmm. So you have people contributing, and I guess that goes back to your original uh, point, which is that people are contributing as an investment, an investment in the music, in the, in the development of new pieces, mm -hmm. and so on. It's, it's, it's a way that, that somebody might actually sponsor a, a, uh, an artist mm -hmm. in creating uh, new, new work for the future. Absolutely. We have, uh, we have foundations 
that support specifically the composition of new works. Oh, that's that, interesting. Yeah, that is, that is their only goal, is that they want to see more music perpetuated in this tradition. We have donors, individual donors, that, that all they support in relation to what we do is that particular program. And your donor base is, is, is national and international. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we have donors from all over the world. In, in terms of, uh, of how you uh, interact with your donors, talk a little bit about that. You have, a, you have a staff, you have a development staff. Are the development staff the only people who interact with donors? No, not at all. We use the entire staff uh, as ambassadors, if you will, uh, in varied ways to talk to and our the donors. artists as well? Oh, abs yeah, yeah. They're, they're key, in fact. And we have some artists that, that are much more inclined and, and uh, are better at that kind of work than others, to be sure. Uh, Eric Carland is one example. He's a, he's a terrific young drummer, and uh, we put him in front of our donors as often as we can. He's very eloquent, he's very uh, effusive, uh, affable, and uh, really relates well to the people and uh, has no compunction um, doing it for the purposes that we lay out for him. He understands that these are the people that allow so much of our programming to happen in the first place. And, and um, of course, uh, Randall Klein, who is the founder, um, mm -hmm. is, is very involved in fundraising. Now, you also have recently gone to a different organization structure in which uh, Randall uh, focuses um, as the artistic executive director, mm -hmm. and uh, Felice Swap has, has taken on the role of the uh, operating uh, executive director. Mm -hmm. That partnership now is very interesting, and particularly as a development director, you're, you're kind of reporting to two people plus the board and so on. How, does, how is that working? That's working really well. Uh, while that construct is very new to this organization, it's a relatively standard construct in the world of, the, of performing arts. And to the largest extent, I think what it has allowed SF Jazz to do is build a framework from which it can really grow and expand. Uh, frankly, the kind of growth that we're talking about uh, and planning for was simply too much to be anchored into one seat. Right. Um, and we felt that either organizationally or artistically, something was going to suffer as a result. Some things are going to fall through cracks, as it were. And so we brought in Felice, who's a top-notch organizational development management person. Uh, and that has freed up Randall to do A, what he loves the most, and B, what he does the best, which is to focus on the art itself. For 25 years, bringing people in and, and thinking through what the future might be for jazz and, and how that future could be presented and, and incited and through there, an organization like uh, SFJ. Yes, and there are very few people in the country that have that level of expertise and skill that Randall does. We're really fortunate to have him And then you also have peop two different people with skill sets going back to, to donors. Some donors will probably respond more to one uh, and more, uh, and some more to the other in terms of the leadership of the organization. If somebody is more interested in certain aspects of the of the organization, you would bring the appropriate person or the appropriate team to bear. There are some donors that will will stretch their giving because they've been inspired. You know, so for those kinds of donors, yes, it's Randall who's in the room. There's there's no question about it because he can talk about the music, he can talk about the musicians, he has personal relationships with those musicians, uh, and he can talk about it in a way that is utterly inspiring. Conversely, there are other donors who take the beauty and the magic as a foregone conclusion. You're not in the room if you're not good at, at right. this. What they are more concerned about is competency. And you know, can we continue to deliver what this magic in a fiscally sound, uh, smart growth? The, kind of the competency to deliver the infrastructure. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so that's what Felice represents, and some of the other team members. That, that I, I'll give you one example. We had a, a new board member um, who was interviewing us as much as we were interviewing him. Uh, a gentleman of uh, terrific capacity. Uh, he's an attorney. His brother is a very famous jazz bassist, and he moved to the Bay Area and was recruited by another board member. He told this board member, I am only going to sit on one board. I'm not one of those people that sits on eight boards. He said, I'm, I'm going to focus all of my time, energy, and philanthropy on one. You are one of a half a dozen organizations I'm looking at. And so she called me and said, I need you to, he wants to come and visit some key people in the uh, related to the staff, and he doesn't want to sit with Randall or Felice. He wants to sit with staff people. Pick the right people to put in the room. So I put our education director and our membership coordinator because I had a sneaking suspicion his questions 
were not going to be about the music. His brother is a famous jazz musician. He knows the music. He wants to see how we're, we're increasing our membership. He's going to want to know uh, how it is that we're creating outreach to underserved communities. And, and sure enough, those were the exact questions uh, that he posed to us that day. And so I was really glad that I had the right people in the room to give him the answers he was looking for. That's fantastic. You know, SF Jazz has always had very strong support, but the, but the, um, the board has evolved and has evolved from strength to strength to strength. And now it seems that the board is incredibly diverse. Incredibly diverse, uh, um, socioeconomically, racially, uh, in terms of the varied kind of expertise, uh, financial capacity, all of that by design. We didn't want to have a board that was focused primarily with people who could simply write checks. We didn't want it conversely focused uh, on with with people for whom just the music part of it was, was the most important work that we were going to be doing. We really wanted a diverse board, uh, board and we have that now. Uh, they range in age from, I would say, mid-30s to you know, one gentleman in his 80s. Uh, we have a strong representation from, the, from folks down in Silicon Valley in the high-tech industry. Uh, we also have folks that are very representative of the, if you will, San Francisco old guard, old moneyed families, uh, and everything in between. And what that has done is created a really rich pageant of discussion and dialogue uh, and, and looking at priorities and whatnot from completely different viewpoints which allows us to come to the best decisions much more quickly. In a so way. you have board members challenging each other's mm -hmm. uh, assumptions, their conclusions, and that must um, make for some very lively uh, uh, board meetings. <laughs> lively is a, a nice way to put that, yes. Uh, in a very healthy way, we have um, an edgy kind of dialogue sometimes. Um, we will have... Sort of like jazz. Sort of like jazz, that's exactly right. Um, and, and some improvisation that goes on in terms of how we move the whole organization forward in those conversations with the board. Um, there will be some folks who will say in a board meeting, you know, that's not really going to play well here in the city. And then we have somebody down from Silicon Valley say, well, that's the only way that that's going to play to my constituency. So we have to either do both or do some amalgam of each. Uh, and, and come to this way uh, that we can serve all, all the folks that we need to serve. It's interesting how you link that into, into constituencies. So, so SF Jazz has a constituency. It has a traditionalist constituency. Mm -hmm. As you were evolving the board and as the board was evolved prior to your uh, arriving at SF Jazz, was there a lot of attention paid to those constituencies and, and how those constituencies might evolve in the future? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, we, it was very intentional. Uh, uh, when we laid out a growth plan for the board, we had a broad kind of criteria, not in terms of, well, our criteria is broad so we can just invite anybody uh, in, but it was more we need to have a, this group represented and that group represented in this group so that all coming together, we had that global viewpoint. And uh, it was, it, like I said, it was very intentional, it was very thoughtful and mindful. Uh, and so some of the people that we then reached out to to recruit to the board came via that construct. Again, it wasn't just, oh, he's wealthy, let's talk to him. He may have been wealthy, but he also had a whole other kind of uh, expertise and experience that we wanted brought to the table as well. Now, these are very challenging economic times. Uh, we're serving an awful lot of organizations that are, that are beginning to scale back mm -hmm. their fundraising efforts. They're mm -hmm. beginning to, um, to go for less ambitious, uh, more standardized programming. Mm -hmm. um, jazz seems that that in and of itself would seem to be a risky uh, tactic mm -hmm. uh, to go for less innovation, right. more standard. Um, how are you handling these, these times? You know, you hit it right on the head. Um, I would say that in some sense it's been intentional fearlessness and in that uh, we feel very strongly, and I think any organization uh, should feel very strongly about their core mission. Ours in particular, we feel is really important in that all of the challenges that have happened within the country over the last 10 years even, starting from 9-11, working all the way through the economic collapse and everything else, we feel our core mission helps define what we as Americans are. We represent the one true indigenous art form that this country has had to offer the rest of the world. 
it is uniquely American. And we feel it is incumbent upon us, incumbent upon our donors, to help not just perpetuate, but keep healthy and even to grow this one thing that is uniquely American. Um, it gets harder and harder, I think, to define some things that are uniquely American. Jazz is, is clearly one of those things. And so we feel uh, very strongly that it is really important, uh, even in tough economic times, to not only focus people's resources on the most immediate needs, housing, food, uh, social services, things like that, that obviously we're very committed to, but also to the things that also aspire the other end of the spectrum. You know, we have to take care of the least of us, if you will, um, but by the same token, we have to hold uh, uh, very carefully the things that make us a wonderful and unique culture. We have to aspire to, to both at the same time. And so when we talk to donors, we tell them categorically, we do not want you to uh, reduce anything else that you do for our community. We don't. We don't want you, in order to support us, we don't want you to reduce anything else. But what we, we do say is that we feel that in a different kind of way, we are just as important as this other work that you're doing over here. And many of your concerts are free. Many of your programs are free to the public. Mm -hmm. So I suppose in, in that respect, you're integrating your programming into a concern Mm -hmm. for those of us who are suffering through um, very, very difficult times. But, but still, they have access to the art. They have to. I think, that again, the folks that struggle need to be able to have access to the same things that the folks who aren't struggling have access to. Again, this is sort of, at least within the world of jazz, that has always been the tradition in, in some sense because jazz musicians themselves traditionally have struggled financially, always. It's a key part of our mission to make sure that every time we have a, an artist, we pay them. Uh, that, is a, that is a benchmark uh, for us. And so the artists themselves have a lot of empathy and a lot of sympathy and, and are more than eager to uh, engage in outreach programs and do concerts for free and, and that sort of stuff. I mean, Ornette Coleman drove a cab for years and years and years after he had become Ornette Coleman. Uh, just being Ornette Coleman does not necessarily mean you're living in a big house on the hill. And <clears throat> So we do uh, concert series all over the city, all over the Bay Area, down in the peninsula. Uh, we do a lot of programs in schools that allow for kids who don't have access to instruments, who don't have access to formalized lessons, things like that. We give them that access. And so we feel that it's an incumbent upon us. It's our responsibility to make sure that we are not just that you know, beautiful pinnacle place on the hill where people have to go and spend 50 bucks to, to go to a concert, but rather coming down off that hill and making sure that what we do is spread out all over our community. So this value of intentional fearlessness comes not only from the art, it also comes, it also imbues the way you approach the community. It is a matter of uh, being true to that conviction of intentional fearlessness and, and pushing beyond perhaps your means at times and then finding a way to engage investors in those activities that, that serve the community, that serve the art, that serve the artists, that serve the public. Uh, it, is a, it is a very, very sophisticated uh, approach. It is. And the other thing that I would say, too, is, that, and this sounds a little crass, but part of the development world is a little bit crass, but not everybody's been clobbered by the economic downturn. Uh, I mean, clearly, it's the worst economic downturn we've seen in some time in general, but there are individuals, there are companies, there are foundations who have not lost their corpus. And so it, as development people, it's incumbent upon us to be much more careful and mindful about who it is that we talk to and more, much more clearly articulate uh, the value of what we do to those people who still can support that thing. And, uh, and I think that we at SF Jazz do a really good job of that for, for the reasons that we're talking about. Um, and as much as anything else, too, whether it's our board members, some of our key donors, to a person, they have a passion for the music itself, which makes my job a little bit easier in that regard. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and the future of SF Jazz. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank, thank you so for much. Your insights. You bet.